All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be brief and loud. Yeah, um, so loud. <laughs> Uh, so, thanks Chris for inviting us, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure and it's really good to see so many people here who actually look surprisingly awake even without morning coffee. Kudos to you all. Uh, we are Eitz and Alvar from Transomise. Uh Nice photographs of us as well. Uh, I'm Alvar, uh, I've been writing code professionally for about 15 plus years now done a few things here and there, done a little bit of banking, done a little bit of telcos, done a little bit of hobby projects here and there. And now for the past three years, I've done something that I really, really feel passionate about, which is moving money internationally at Transwise and building the engine for it. And uh, I'm Edgar, <coughs> who spent, I guess, a good half of my life in different kinds of startups. And uh, I guess half of it was IT startups and uh, now I landed into fintech company, another buzzword, uh, and really like it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about you as well. So how many of you actually push code to the production? Nice half, I'd say. This is pretty cool. Okay. Interestingly, it's back rows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's actually a few extra seats here, so like to all the shy Estonians in the back row, like you're you're all welcome. Uh, okay, uh, how many people develop business functionality? How, how many would call yourselves developers, coders? A bit more. Front okay. rows join. This this is all preaching to the choir. This is like so so weird. Uh, how many of you would call themselves managers? Okay, nice. Yeah, sixth or so. Cool, cool. Um, that's. I'm. I actually think this is quite exciting. So, like, we. I think a lot of the same people who call themselves developers also raised their hand when they said they push code, which is kind of cool and which is really a lot about like preaching to the choir today. But let's see how this goes. Also, or we wanted to know how many people have idea what transferize is at all. Uh, can you raise your hands? Looks like we. Oh, no. <laughs> we're, uh, we're still going to carry you through some basic introductions and a little bit of context and background, so please bear with us. Tech gods really aren't on our side today. This is weird. I think it might be my empty batteries. No, that's cool. I can push the button. Doesn't still work. not working. <laughs> this is uh, brain freeze. All right. Yeah, now it works. Um, so, we at Transomize, uh, or at least our founders, have been working to bring fairness to finance for about five years now. The company was founded in 2011. And to bring that fairness to finance, we started from a place where the pain is quite large, which is international money transfers. And this is our main focus also for the time, uh, time being and, and our main products. Um, in Q1 this year, we moved about a billion pounds uh, across across countries and, and different currencies. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. We're quite uh, quite excited about it. However, that has its own constraints and concerns. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, and you've seen that many times for sure how companies slow down, and this is especially true for uh, industries that are regulated. If we're talking about financial companies, uh, when we want people to trust us and we need to communicate with banks, it is <coughs> lots of standards, compliances you need to comply with immediately. And it is really easy to split into teams doing their own business. Uh, and as a result, having fences between uh, parts of the company and uh, see all this stuff slowing down. Um, and given that our product engineering, which for us consists of people building the logic, as in developers that we call product engineers, and product owners slash managers slash, we usually call them product people. Um, the number of these people has literally grown tenfold over the past three, uh, three years. And inevitably, 
like the question arises, like how do we organize? Obviously, the question didn't come up at like this hundred people point. It rather came up at around the ten or fifteen people point, and we figured um, we figured that there would never be we would never be able to hire enough smart managers, enough smart project owners, uh, product owners, uh, to just come in and make all the decisions for us. Um, and we really understood that if we built, an, uh, built a hierarchy, this would stop us from being as flexible and as agile as we would want to be. Uh, hence, we, we rather figured, let's look at what matters to our customers. Let's look at KPIs and metrics that kind of show that to us, which is examples like speed of transfers, uh, conversion rate, which is, uh, which is another good one, because the higher our conversion rate is, the cheaper we can make our prices, because that means less money spent on, uh, on marketing, for instance. And then we literally tried to build teams behind these main KPIs that we, uh, that we have, and tell all the teams that whatever you need to do to make that number move, you're free to do. And for reference for scale, it's uh, 100 we have in engineering. Uh, we are, I guess, like 700 strong now. Yes, yeah, Going close to there sure. and uh, still doing good in the sense that we are, by all ratings, one of the most attractive employers. So people feel happy joining and being with us. Um, but this all obviously also has some, some pains to it. We, as, well, I guess any other small little startup idea thingy starts, uh, starts with just something that responds to HTTP requests on the web and, and builds and serves web pages and it, it's all pretty fine and dandy uh, until it isn't. Uh, and uh, as, we, as we have moved towards this organizational model uh, of having all the teams, we we saw a struggle there because the teams actually could not be as autonomous as they wanted because they all had to share the same sandbox in a way. So sandbox requires splitting. First, it was natural move of having like chopping something in a half, but uh, quite soon we figured out that uh, microservices and small relatively autonomous parts with clear interfaces is the way to go. Um, and we've been already somewhat successful in that. So three years ago, we were doing just one release per week, and that was quite okay because there were not that much, that many developers. Today, we're doing how many? It's uh, something going over two hundreds per week. I don't know. Uh, okay, financial company is not uh, that typical pattern. But who goes with their company with more than two hundred live pushes a week? Okay, we're doing good. <laughs> Most of them are successful. Most. Um, however, to, uh, to get to that number, well, the number itself is meaningless, so there is no, no point in saying that 200 is a, is a great, great number of releases per week, and it, it all comes down to who are the teams actually making the changes, what are the changes needing to be pushed, all of the changes. Mm let's say, should carry some, some value, but we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, it's just, the question is, how, like how, does, how does our architecture or system design support all that? And, uh, and that is actually something that teams maybe haven't been so happy to uh, always prioritize themselves, because it's inevitably the question of doing some really short-term quick win for the customer, or then taking a little bit of time to sharpen the saw and actually maybe invest like a couple of weeks to break out your business logic into the separate service and, and essentially be a lot faster down the road, but it's always you know, about finding this great balance between short term and long term. And while we definitely see that the move can happen, uh, we also have seen that Conway's law sometimes needs a little bit of a, of a push and like teams need to be inspired and motivated uh, somehow to, to make these changes. Usually comes down to actually just telling them that, hey dudes, it's okay to slow down for a while and just kind of take your time and you know clean up your house and it will all be better. But at the end of the day, it means that you figure out on average 200 times sooner that you did right or wrong. 
which really matters. True. Um, we have um, we have a few principles. Uh, I, let's call them engineering principles or software engineering principles that we follow uh, in order to uh, in in order to keep uh, keep the ball rolling. One of them uh, one of them really has been embracing Conway's law. So when some people or let's say historically, when I first read about the Conway's law, it was for me it seemed rather like something that's uh, that's inevitable and kind of bad, and and usually usually carries a bad taste because because it's kind of like a, it usually has symptoms that that uh, that are somehow painful. So like we have set up our organization in some way that seemed to be that seemed to be efficient and effective, and then in the end we got the system and everybody built silos and yada 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 yada. We try to make it work for us, and uh, uh, and we've kind of seen that something called the weak ownership model that like we pretty much go by the definition if you go on wikipedia and look what weak ownership model is then we're like quite close to quite close to that so everybody owns the business logic that they work on the most and that they they impact the most uh, however whoever needs to make a change there shouldn't book time or, or shouldn't build this huge Gantt diagram of, of critical chains and, and, and dependencies. Rather, they should be able to go in and make the changes themselves, given that the owners have, uh, like, have knowledge of that and, and approve that. It goes through reviews, uh, typically. So <coughs> the owner of the code actually is never blocking at the same time, keeping control over what's happening in his part. Uh, and with iterations uh, from classical model, and especially with uh, hardcore infra people, this uh, really natural thought that smaller are changes, faster iterations, uh, more stable is system. It takes time to root, but it works, and really works for us. Uh, with uh, components that are deployed uh, with higher frequency, uh, fail rate is dropping visually. So we do statistics, we see that it really is good for us. Yeah, I guess essentially we can say that the number of failed or bad releases kind of is constant in time. But if we do the, if we release the other stuff more often, then like overall the success rate goes up in a way. So. Uh, Basically, same same amount of screw ups, but you it's easier to detect <laughs> because uh, you granularly you see what change broke. So it's uh, what uh, we surprisingly had to prove to many people that it really works. Uh, well, essentially, yeah. So if you screw up, then you screw up this you know failed change and not everything around it. So that's uh, that's why it's kind of good for us so far. And uh, maybe the third principle, to wrap it all up a little bit, uh, we think that the product teams responsible for some specific services, pieces of the business logic, should really be responsible for them across the whole life cycle. Uh, it starts from an idea. We, we've always been pretty good with that, so there's never been like some oracle telling a team what to build. Uh, but it also ends when the life cycle of that thing kind of dies off or like when we really kill that component from production and involves everything in between also full control over the release cycle and uh, and monitoring and uh, we'll be telling you a little bit more about like how how that looks like exactly obviously with great power comes great responsibility and people are sometimes not very willing to take that responsibility and and that is that is true there's there's no point in painting a really nice picture and saying that all the developers are super happy about being on call uh, it takes time and it takes takes a little bit of thinking through uh, what what that actually means so like being on call usually is painful if you need to be on call for somebody else's fuck ups if you need to be on call for your own it kind of becomes much more natural and, and even like kind of real or fair and honest. Uh, for me as an infra person, it's uh, most shocking part is how many developers are totally thrilled and shocked by the fact that their code should run 24-7. Uh, 
they assume that 5 p.m. it ends running. Okay, 10 p.m. <laughs> Um, but well, it's, it's, it's like a learning point, so it's just something that doesn't come to people naturally, but whenever, like, every, um, everybody at TransferWise understands that we have global customers that we are serving and we are providing value to them, so part of providing that value is actually making sure that our systems are up and running. So if put this way, it kind of all makes perfect sense. If it, if it comes down to the details, then, then uh, it, it is something that... Um, it's something that sometimes needs talking through, and, and what helps gain that confidence to, to be on call, first of all, as I said before, like it's literally being responsible for only your pieces of the system, and, uh, and also having good and reasonable tooling around that. And, and it's like the magic should be taken away from there, and then it should be more or less, more or less easy to know what to do if something breaks. And finally, what's, uh, what that gives, uh, gives people is really, really good and fast feedback from production. And there's, there's nobody to mask the signal, there's nobody to generate noise. If, uh, if, if this partner import isn't working, the people responsible for it immediately get the message. Yeah, we s for some reason, we concentrate now on troubles, but it is the um, most motivating and joyful thing as well, because uh, having real uh, feedback and really seeing immediately, instantly, what did you do, is it right or wrong, is the most motivating part we figured out. This real ownership, not waiting for any kind of feedback for analyst or infram. Uh, also, you make the change, you push the change, it builds, you have a nice green build, then it's a big difference whether you can just push the button and deploy it, or whether you need to wait around for the next release, which can happen the next day or the next week or whatnot, and it will just clutter your mind meanwhile in a way. Uh, so clean, clean, clean mind is, is always working better as, uh, as well. But fair enough. Uh, we'd like to talk you through uh, what that looks like in practice and what, is, what are the tools that we use. Uh, so taking delivery pipeline, as it was mentioned, uh, developers, engineers are uh, delivering most parts, uh, except some uh, legacy parts which are, say, mentioned monoliths. Um, uh, with build, surprise, surprise, we have Jenkins. Um, I think like 80. 90% are using Jenkins, and uh, there, is, uh, there are long stories, but nothing surprising. It's uh, doing builds and tests. But uh, one part we had to invent ourselves, as we could not find anything that really satisfies us, is our uh, tools to deploy live. So basically, this part it developed in-house. It is not Octopus, you will Google out. Actually, we were lazy to Google. We hacked something together, had name for that, and figured out that we collide with someone. But it's totally different thing. Is basically we have um, some uh, tooling for developers where they have really simple uh, interface to have their versions deployed, rolled back, and seen if they are successfully deployed. Nothing fancy. You authorize people and. Uh, uh, make them do stuff, and all the magic happens on uh, feedback loop, uh, which is named uh, monitoring here. Here we didn't develop anything, and for this reason, as we could not find any tool that is really all around what we want, we have really big choice of them. So they all together cover our needs. Uh, Rollbar for exceptions and. Uh, F more for investigations where you go deeper is New Relic and Delk. And uh, Zabbix is more like framework -y kind of tool when you cannot achieve something with uh, ready tools. You can always script fancy stuff. Uh, for instance, uh, we're doing uh, uh, just uh, hooking bigger local scripts on production service when we need to have some parametric analysis for, for stuff and uh, generate alerts on that. Uh, at release time, it is all quite sufficient. Uh, people are 
watching, big, big eyes on monitors, what's happening, but uh, if really something breaks in the middle due to some built-up failures, we also push messages uh, using Victorops, which is really nice thing to schedule stuff. If team wants to rotate, for instance, and make sure that there are no gaps and, and always some one is on duty, but it's not like three, four people having the same signal, say, waking you up. Uh, Slack yeah, is very much uh, when you are online and also good old classical SMS. Happily, uh, some mobile providers still provide some uh, email to SMS gateways, so you just can push emails to people who love waking up. Mainly that's uh, Zabbix who, <laughs> who does that. So, yeah, if, if we kind of walk through this, uh, this list of tools and then look at the typical service release, uh, what, that, what that looks like is essentially, well, Jenkins gives you a nice green build, it's like in the form of a jar file, you use Octopus to then like, oh, it get, gets pushed to Artifactory. Uh, you type the next version number into, into that Octopus thingy and just push deploy pretty much. You get a nice tail of the application log to see whether things went, uh, went all right, more or less. And then you go to Rollbar and New Relic to see if, uh, if there is any new exceptions, if there's... Uh, any performance issues, if any of the transactions or any, any of the endpoints uh, kind of suffered, suffered some performance problems. If you see anything off, let's say on Rollbar, you take the request ID or some other sort of identifier, you go to Elk and then look what, what happened around that specific, uh, specific request. Uh, and yeah, usually if you're on like release duty or if you're releasing, you're releasing something or monitoring something, that's pretty much it. So VictorOps, uh, for instance, comes in when something happens like off hours or out, uh, outside of that, that specific releasing time frame. Uh, that all sounds all right for us. How does it sound for you? We really hope you can teach us something today because like we're kind of new at this. Um, it's not actually that hunky dory. We obviously have a lot of challenges as well that we'd be happy to uh, happy to share. How well are we doing with breaking the monolith heights? I always complain. Because <laughs> you, you pushed the button there, right? <laughs> huh? Because because you pushed the button there. Yeah, I pushed the button, and uh, it's. 10 to 20 times higher, higher fail rate on Monolith. So for us, there is no question anymore if uh, microservices are the right way to go. And uh, I am complaining all the time. I'm not a developer. <laughs> you are? Tell me when. Still haven't done it. We depend on the 79 other guys. Um, so we have actually two larger web apps. Uh, well, again, started from that one big one, and, and then we split that into a back office application and uh, and the public facing application. Uh, and for a couple of reasons, uh, they are still actually released centrally by our platform slash info guys, such as Etz and his team. Um, and the reason for that is uh, we conveniently built database migrations into the web apps, and that's how they run. And I think that has been a very right decision to make. Uh, the interesting bit is now how we get the database to become like a kind of a component of its own, and like the persistence layer should really be broken away from uh, from the business logic. Also, uh, as all people are mining big business and want analytics, <coughs> we have. Um, uh, central analytics uh, storage and tooling which has really really high load people try to tweak all the stats and get all the numbers together figuring out if they are doing some things right or wrong uh, that's a challenge for us especially uh, if you take uh, services that have their own persistence uh, running on different engines you need to aggregate everything you need to denormalize to make it work fast for analytics we basically having 200 analytics in-house. So that's that's a challenge for us uh, as uh, amounts are growing and we don't have really c 
clear plan what patterns to follow here, how to structure it to work really well and fast. Um, another one is uh, kind of keeping uh, keeping a grip around this growing number of services. I think we have a couple of dozen microservices by now. Uh, obviously, that number will only grow, and that is a good thing in itself. However, it also means we just essentially, you know, when you move to when you break uh, like a big ball up to smaller balls, you just actually move the complexity out of the ball. So like to manage that complexity, you have to have tooling and understanding in place. What are the dependencies? If something's down, what else breaks? Managing contracts, managing endpoint versions. Uh, we're lucky enough to not have that problem, but I think we've also been hopefully clever enough to not let that stop us. Uh, rather to to start moving and then then kind of figure these things out as we go. Whenever we do pick a platform for that, it will be difficult to change just because you inevitably bake some of that into the services themselves, like as in discovery, whether you're doing server side or client side uh, load balancing. There's a bunch of questions that uh, that you kind of have to principally just decide about. And to remind you, that's an environment where we cannot afford to lose a single record. So uh, this uh, puts some extra constraints. And uh, security is another big challenge, uh, meaning all the processes, standards, uh, and requirements are built around either something really old, which is like non-IT requirements, and uh, some newer uh, standards and audits and everything. They don't really follow. they still like 10 years old. They don't refresh well. They, they account for processes where you have some authority. Or that you don't have um, like security process built in teams, but you have someone who is responsible, some officer. And we don't really like it because it looks like another fence in the process and another like delegation of responsibility and something. Uh, we quite well moving into the way having security as just another quality dimension for a product, um, be it like, let's it be available, nice product and secure product. So setting up for process and, and having knowledge in teams so they understand that it's, it's just, just what is required. But it's, it's really, really, really a challenge. Uh, still, we're trying to put normally to work. On the other hand, we are on good way to becoming PCI compliant in a few months' time, maybe half a year's time. Uh, so this is just something that we that we need to do. Carries its own rules and and uh, rules and regulations. And uh, well, I guess if we comply, then we have some mechanisms in place that do what they're supposed to do. So we, as a financial service, and, and trust being very very important for us, we we also see that as a bit of a wider topic than just kind of being able to make a tick box or like make, make a tick in, uh, in, a, in a box somewhere. Yeah, but the fact is that we're going creative on compliance, especially the fact that we have one entity that is working in different countries and uh, saying PCI is clearly not enough. We, we need to comply with much more standards in uh, US and, and go into Asia and everywhere. So uh, it is quite a lot of requirements uh, and we don't want to solve it classical way. Uh, we want to make it work in, in small vertical teams and we need to keep on really quick delivery. Uh, pulling it together a little bit, so what does DevOps mean for us? Whenever you Google it, whenever you talk to people, we, uh, I think we had a job rec up some time ago, where we like, tried, to, tried to hire a DevOps engineer you, well, I, I do believe you all can imagine like how many different people that brought in. It was a, an interesting learning point. There was literally like five or six different profiles that that, that job ad attracted. Uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, we, I, I think the definitions probably would be different for different, different companies, but here's ours. So we think the product teams themselves should always own their stuff uh, from beginning to the end. Again, like there's no handovers in between. 
uh, when you look at, I think it's called DevOps patterns, DevOps anti-patterns, there's a website where somebody has actually done an interesting job and then pulled together some nice Venn diagrams about like how the DevOps team fits into the picture and like there's dev team and ops team and sometimes there's like a DevOps team as a bubble in one of them and sometimes the DevOps team is in between and something like that. We don't have a DevOps team. We also don't have DevOps people, meaning that we believe that developers totally can do it given the right tools and, and like given the right sort of responsibilities. We also have a platform team as yeah, a central only, point. Uh, we uh, only s split is platform team, which is basically some function to offer infrastructure as a service to developers and all the tooling to put pieces together to deliver. Uh, in the sense I think it's good to mention we, our QA stuffing is not good either. We don't have DevOps. We have zero testers. No I think QA that's people. I think that's pretty good so far, actually. So <laughs> yes, we don't see it as a as a team. <laughs> Testing is pretty good. We don't see it as a teams. We see it m more as a process in teams, and it works. Come on, it's. 2016, we can automate everything. We're right? happy to put our green builds live. I guess that's kind of, you know, that, that says it nicely. Uh, so, yep, something that we tell all our developers from time to time. If you build it, you also run it. That's there's pretty much no way no way around it. Uh, it's the it's the way it works. And the main main value behind that is that we believe that autonomous people are happy people. If you can do your stuff yourself, this is a very huge form of motivation and inspiration for yourself in a, in a daily work. Uh, if you want to come and help us with some of the problems, we're happy to hear you out and uh, we, uh, we, we need smart people. Mandatory plug. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> yes, we're growing, growing, growing. We need more people. But it looks like we, we have about eight minutes for questions and, and discussion. We'd be happy to get some. Ooh, yay. First one. Awesome. Uh, yeah, the question was: yeah, Has there any? Has there been? Uh, has there been an example of actually <coughs> deprecating or killing a piece of existing functionality? I think, in terms of services, actually, no. Just I do believe it's rather because we have been relatively like we're young, and as as the services would be reasonably aligned with product features or like slices of the product. Uh, we have killed off large parts of the code base uh, from the from the bigger web app, not just as kind of moving it out, but also like literally just killing it because a feature doesn't make sense. I do believe we are able to do the same uh, once we get to that point with a service. I think it's rather an interesting question: How does a team understand that the thing that they have been working on is hitting marginal returns or doesn't make sense anymore? That's so like you know the technical part probably will follow pretty easily after that. I think. Uh, you, you said that you came here to learn as well as to share your, your knowledge. What would you say is the, uh, the most important challenge that you're facing at the moment and could use help with from people here? I think the most important challenge is... Oh, sorry, the question was, what's the... Oh, you were using the mic. Sorry, slightly <laughs> confused. No repeat. Um, I think the biggest, uh, biggest challenge actually is to kind of get the get the technical blueprint right for the services, as in like basically finding out what the right foundation is in terms of enabling discovery, good dependency management, but also equally important, at least equally important, is figuring out what the right domain contexts are and what the, what the right contracts are around the services, because these would also be pretty hard to change. Uh, 
we, like many of us, are true believers in the domain-driven design approach. I hope that will help us. Obviously, we'll fail here and here or there as well. Let's hope we get the big blocks right. But I think these are the two big ones. So again, if somebody has experience, <laughs> please, please come and tell us. My question is, um, we are talking a lot about um, the microservices. Uh, what is your definition about microservice and how do you treat it? <laughs> because you can do it in different ways. And um, why it came up for me is uh, you said that you release 200 days per week. So how many microservices you have? So we can... Yeah, we have... Uh so part of those releases are the two big web apps, which usually have like one or two releases per day. And then we have about, I think about 40 services by now. Like the, well, the number is changing pretty quick, but yeah. And not all of them are obviously changing at the same pace. So there are some that maybe even have like three or four releases per day sometimes. But, uh, well, and then there are some that just kind of tick around. So like, let's say our rate aggregator that pulls in rates from different sources is a good example. So it just runs there and well, behaves nicely. Um, but regarding uh, definition of a microservice, I, I don't think we could even try. I think, you know, what makes sense for us is for a team inside their business domain to kind of define this sort of a bounded context. It's kind of abstract in that sense. Like I, thinking of thinking of good examples here. So like I can bring up an example uh, of like a pretty large, not really a very micro service that's going to be born soon enough. So we're pulling our whole like transfer state machine effectively out into a separate service as it will, well, for the time being be owned by a single team. It totally makes sense to at least start with that as a single service, even if that possibly contains well, I, I think like, well, five digits lines of code possibly. So it's not like very micro actually, it's just kind of fits the purpose with, with, with that sort of size. We, we have smaller, smaller services as, as well. I think, well, our GeoIP service is a good one. Like we have a GeoIP database, we have like a like pretty thin service wrapper around that. Very single function, very specific, but again, makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm not answering your question really, but I don't think we also have like a good definition. Interestingly, we never went to any kind of battles or discussions about what it is. It didn't stop us from doing anything. It's like if there is clear functionality or clear service you can offer and, and split from the system with clear contract, that is. Uh, do we need academic definition for that? I wonder what are scenarios where you really need to have clear definition for that? Is it about when you need to decide if you need to split something into two or join or what are scenarios for that? I think the question about how to define the microservices, as you, as you mentioned actually, is uh, uh, what the service is really doing. And uh, I'm also the operation person and understanding that uh, that if you have too many microservices, you cannot manage uh, the different interaction between the services anymore. And uh, this is the kind of thing I wanted to understand that uh, how you define the microservice. Uh, I, I understand that this uh, could be this and that, but um, it should fit into one purpose and should not uh, break it into too many components. Mm -hmm. So just understanding how, how you see your, and I understood from your explanation that it's more or less the team uh, that handles one microservice as, as such. I, I think that that is like a good approximation, meaning that um, from the object-oriented development best practices, we know like that code that changes together should kind of go together. It's quite similar with the services. And if we have teams owning business logic that they work on the most, kind of follows that they, they, they should fall together the same way or align the same way. 
we definitely are not in, in that camp who really tries to like go crazy and split every single function out into a separate service. That really doesn't seem to have any big value. Sounds cool. I think we have, uh, well, we have minus two minutes for questions. Chris went away, so. <laughs> uh, ah, yeah. I'm here, sorry. So the question is, uh, how do you manage UI? Do product teams, uh, are, are they responsible for the UI or it is a separate team? How mm -hmm. do you do that? Excellent question. Uh, uh, interestingly, a yes and no question, meaning that today we do have uh, our, our mobile apps today are owned by, uh, by our mobile dev team. We already have developers in other teams contributing to that as well. The main reason for that is simply historical that like we started off trying basically trying out building apps and then just it went that way now we try to get that function as widely kind of like yeah widely widely distributed in the teams as possible another aspect is that it's easy to fix a web release it's very hard to fix a mobile release uh, so that is sort of an exception and we're trying to kind of push it uh, push that side as well with the web uh, teams own the UI uh, we, I think from the public website, we have about 80% of the UI today built on Angular and it's split up into separate Angular apps The teams can deploy separately, essentially. So like we just push the new version of the static content uh, up onto the load balancers and, and that just gets, gets served from there. It's also a good driver to like migrate to, to Angular because that kind of gives you a better, better release cycle uh, for the UI. Okay, close to 100 already, and that's really split one, yes. We had one more question, and even two more. Can we take one more? <laughs> Chris, one more, please. One more. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, it's closer here. <laughs> it's, it's your coffee break. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How do you manage uh, deployments that include uh, database changes, like uh, structural changes? Today, we have uh, migrations running together with both of our bigger web apps. It's kind of the same database and same change log, but kind of both the, both the web apps can trigger those. Again, it used to be just one app and like, well, anyway, one deployable, now it's, now it's two. Where we want to be is just break that away, which would inevitably, of course, bring the joys of backward database change, uh, basically database change backward compatibility and all kinds of interesting th stuff that we need to test for. Uh, we're in the process of figuring that out. We definitely want to move away from there because that would also give developers the chance to deploy the web apps themselves. One more question, please. Last, last, question. last question. Yeah, yeah. short one. Uh, what is the rate of live delivery failures and what's the main reason behind them? Excellent question. As I said before, with services, I think it's a lot. I think in services, it's like maybe, I don't know, three to five percent is a gut. <coughs> Okay, disclaimer that we have really, really good checks on backward compatibility and uh, on w we're all back uh, quite immediately on failed releases. So with uh, this monolith, it's really, really low success rate. It's uh, s uh, across here, I guess it's something like 75% or something, but it's not any kind of drama for us as we just assure that we can uh, back off quickly. With services, it is really uh, over 90. I miss stats at the moment, but it's, it's, it's way higher. Essentially, that question brings, brings out a really good point. We are not afraid to fail. 75 is nothing to write home about, obviously, and we're quite ashamed of that. Uh, the, well, yeah, there, is, uh, there are several reasons uh, that we can elaborate on over the coffee. Uh, <laughs> but well, yeah, uh, we. I guess the kind of core answer is we're not afraid to. We're not afraid to fail. We rather optimize for mean time to recovery than mean time between failures. <laughs> Thank you very much. Big hand, please.